Here's another page. These are, these, all these white ones are from when I was in college. This one talks about how I just have this wonderful capacity to turn myself off. I can just not feel a thing. And it's not even that I'm angry or that I'm hating. There's just nothing there. And when I eat, I don't even taste the food. I, I'm just here, but I'm not. And then on the other page, I was in a Shakespeare class, and I was supposed to be working on a sonnet, but I pretended to be a creature attacking this thing in a bed, and I was like, crap, I'm working out my psychoses in a Shakespeare class. This is not gonna work for me. Like, it's been five years since I've seen this man, and still his presence is in my life. Then I wrote my own obituary. And I talk about how I just spent years fighting myself, and I just gave in to the dark side. It was about 10 pages. And I mean, if I, when I die, Mine is like taking out all the negative stuff. I would like them to use it because I think I did a pretty good job. But, but I wrote it at the time because I wanted to die then. I don't want to die right now. And I talk about how I couldn't sleep. I just couldn't sleep because that's when the abuse would happen. He would come into my bedroom at night and he would abuse me. And it wasn't violent. I know we're talking about abuse and violence, and this abuse was not that way, it was subtle. And in some ways, because it was subtle, it didn't hurt. Like, no one wants to say that, but when you're being sexually abused, you get confused because those feelings feel good. And so I just couldn't sleep. I've been blogging for years, and I started when I was in college, not really, a lot of people didn't read it then, so I would just write whatever I wanted. So I've been admitted to being depressed on my website. Just talking about how people, some of my friends said they were worried about me because I would just spend hours standing by the train tracks. And I mentioned in here how I just wanted to go stand in front of the train. So I had a lot of issues. I was depressed, I was suicidal, I was self-destructive, controlling, manipulative, paranoid. I was anxious and fearful, I was full of shame. I had low self-worth and insomnia. I fell in love with whiskey. I, he's amazing. I mean, I, we divorced now. But back then we had a <laughs> wonderful relationship. And I was just, I was very, I was self-destructive. Now throughout this time, through college and um, even up until, I don't know, it may have been 05 or 06, I was dealing with a variety of these issues at different times, but there had always been a word or a quote given by someone that had stuck with me. I had written a story, a fiction story about a girl named Sheena who was being abused. And I gave it to my friend to read, and I remember he came back, and he, didn't, he never showed any emotions. He was a very calm guy, and he said when he read it, he cried and he yelled at God, and that he was so angry. And up until that point, it never even occurred to me that I could be angry at God, because I was raised in the cold, and God is fearful and wonderful, and if you like get mad at God, you're going straight to hell. So to hear someone say they got mad at God for me, I was like, what? We can do that? I also watched this movie called The Spitfire Grill, and there was a girl that said, do you think that, it's some, I'm gonna butcher it, I feel bad, but it's something about, do you think, um, like, that the process of healing is just as painful as what caused it? And I was like, wait, that kind of makes sense to me. Because every time I start to even think about these memories, or even just to speak it out loud, I'm just on the floor sobbing. And then when I had told that one friend when he read my fiction story, then I told another friend. And it was just like a little bit of a weight came off of me. And then I was in London, and there was this theater professor that said, we should own the scars in our life. It means that you're still alive. What? No, I'm not. And then there was this other professor that said, we will hurt each other, it's a given. It's what you do afterwards. 
wait, I have to work? Like, I can't just stay a victim and be mad at the world? So I started writing about that. All my life, people tried to put me in therapy and I didn't like it. Uh, I would just BS the therapist. I'd spend the first few sessions being quiet. Then on like the fifth or sixth session, I would give her a little nugget. And each week I'd give her more. And then I'd be like, oh yes, this happened to me and I have a bright future, I wanna be better. And they're like, she has come such a long way. But that goes back to me being manipulative and controlling. But then finally, I wanted help because there were times where I woke up and didn't know where I was, and I had alcoholic poisoning, and I was just partying too much. So I called the therapist, which was kind of awkward. I had to call the helpline from my job's insurance, and this guy answers, and he's like, how can I help you? I need to find a counselor. What kind? A kind that can deal with someone who's been abused? He's like, are you in any danger now? Oh, I kind of am too much. But no, no, I'm fine. I just need to talk to her now. And after all this awkwardness, I found a therapist. And I, I started, I must have found her in 06, because that's when this post went up. And she started having me do things, like lock my bedroom door at night. I had never done that in my entire life. I mean, it makes sense that my stepfather prevented me from doing it, but as an adult, it never occurred to me that I could just lock my bedroom door. And if that helped me sleep an extra hour for that particular night, then that is what I would have to do. I was always scared of running into him on the streets because the police just let him go free. And I lived in Chicago at the time, and he still does. So my therapist said, well, always keep $20 in your pocket so you can hop into a taxi if you see him. Okay, that helps me not be paranoid. Because every time I saw a white van, I would be like, oh God, they're coming to kidnap me. They're gonna take me. So these things started to help. So then I started writing all the things I wish someone said to me. These are all titles of posts on my website. I wrote one called Flashbacks Are Not Flash Forwards because I would get the flashbacks. I could just be having a conversation with someone and a smell or a word would take me back to being seven years old and it would paralyze me. And I would, I would lose my shit. But then I realized that doesn't mean that's my future. This does not have to be tomorrow. Or I wrote about the conflicting nature of good touch, bad touch. We tell kids what bad touch is, but it doesn't feel bad when your stepfather's licking your breast. So I don't understand what good touch, bad touch is. So I wrote this long post on what parents could do about that. I wrote on how to rescue victims because the police who interviewed me sucked. They didn't know what they were doing. I actually walked away blaming myself for the abuse and I had never thought it was my fault. I wrote about the healing process, how you need to do it on your own time. People tried to dictate, you should have forgiven him by now. You're still dealing with that? And so there was a post on that. And I wrote about rage because you have to deal with the rage. You just have to. Whether you write angry letters or go chop some wood or scream in an open field, whatever you have to do. Then I turned, once I started doing this blog, more people were reading it and they're like, wow, she's talking about some heavy stuff. So then I turned to Twitter and there's a whole community on there and there was this man named Sean King who was like this social leader, pastor, extraordinaire. And I don't like pastors because my pastor knew what happened to me. And he told me to be quiet or I would go to hell. So I really just did not like pastors. And then one day Sean King started tweeting about abuse in church and how leaders should be held accountable. Nobody ever said this to me. And I was like, wait, I just, and it was good hearing it from him because he was a pastor. I'd never heard a pastor say it was wrong. And all of a sudden, a huge weight was lifted off of me. And I told him on Twitter, I was like, man, you just kind of saved my life there. Thank you. And he, would, he said he was inspired too. Then, after writing that, I started writing posts that was not just about abuse. Posts that was about you as a person. Because I think that's where the issue also lied. Lied. 
I wasn't empowered as a child and I didn't know the value of my voice. So I wrote posts like what I would want anyone to know. And in that one I talk about how nothing can penetrate your soul. Because my body was, but my soul which is perfect and whole, nobody can touch that. And if I focus on that, then that's gonna help me today and maybe tomorrow. And I wrote posts about one called Trash in the Temple. Because we always say these negative things to ourselves. You're dirty, you're wrong, you're poison. Wait a second. I wouldn't let anybody else say that to me. If my boss said it, we'd be in HR. If a friend said it, wouldn't talk to them anymore. And yet, I was saying the nastiest, cruelest things to myself. So I wrote a post called Trash in the Temple and how we have to take the trash out. You literally have to change your mind. So one of the last posts that I did, it's called Surviving Versus Thriving, because that's one of the bigger things for me. You know, we, we were a victim, and now we're a survivor, but I think it goes beyond that. I think it moves on to what I consider being a thriver. And so in this post, I'll just read a short excerpt, and then I will be done. While the word survivor conveys a positive outcome to a tragedy, I finally looked up the definition and I realized I don't agree with it. A survivor means that you are in existence, that you're alive, that you remain functional or usable. To thrive means that you are prospering, that you're fortunate. It means to grow and develop. It means to grow strong, to make steady progress. I survived childhood sexual abuse. I remained alive. I kept breathing, even on the days I did not want to. I functioned, I got up, I ate, I showered, then I went to bed. Despite it all, I survived. And I think that in and of itself is a feat because some people don't survive. Many of you have survived. Despite whatever your loss or tragedy or illness or anything is, maybe you were not abused, but you lost someone close to you or you were in a car accident and now you only have a limited mobility of your elbow, I don't know. All these things are important, it's the story of your life. So you have things you've survived against as well. But I think it goes beyond just merely existing and functioning. I think it goes to surviving. Just coping enough to muster the strength to breathe eventually wasn't enough for me. Memories were painful, the anger was so tangible, the guilt weighed down on me, the injustice was so unfair, I really don't like cops, but you know, they're here to serve and protect. Um, and if your story is like mine, remembering the touch is kind of the worst just part. I just can't forget it. And there were times when it just felt good to be depressed. No one wants to admit that either, but sometimes I just intentionally refused to heal because it just felt good to be mad at everybody. But I realized that if you do yourself an injustice by not being whole. So I moved past surviving, I moved through the pain, and I moved towards thriving. Because I don't want to live my life at the least of these things. I always said, well, at least I survived. At least I'm standing. At least I took a shower. I don't want to live my life at the least of these things. I deserve to live past surviving. You deserve to live past surviving. It means that I just, I want to do more than breathe. I want to actually live. And there's a difference. People in a coma are breathing. They are in a vegetated state, but they're alive. They survived. And I have to do more than that. And I want you to do more than that, too. So whatever works for you, whether it is seeking therapy, if it's writing angry letters, starting a blog and saying F you to the world, if it's finding an online community or uh, a friend that you can share your story with, or for me it was journaling and blogging or making YouTube videos, whatever it is for you, I would just encourage you to get it out. Because if you don't get it out, it's going to consume you. And it almost consumed me. I have scars on my wrist that will never go away from my attempts. But that's something I will never do again. Because for me, it's all about thriving. So my name is Shimon Lachey.
Thank you.